Um, welcome, everyone. It, my name is Annie Marie Close. I'm a professor in the Department of Psychological Science. Um, and I have the honor of introducing our distinguished speaker today. So, as you know, this is um, one of our speakers in the series of the President's Burak Lecture. And so, as a reminder, this is sponsored by the Burak Lecture Series. Um, also sponsored by the Department of Psychological Science and the UVM Center for Teaching and Learning. And it also contributes to the UVM Faculty Development Series supported by um, the Associate Provost for Faculty Affairs, Dr. Jim Vigoro. So it's really an honor to um, be the person who gets to present our speaker today, Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett. She is a university distinguished professor of psychology at Northeastern University, and she also has appointments at Harvard Medical School and Massachusetts General Hospital. She is a pioneer in research on emotion. She has over 200 publications in the top journals in the field. Uh, she's been awarded over 20 million in research grants and fellowships, including a National Institutes of Health Director's Pioneer Award. These are multi-million dollar awards uh, that support exceptionally creative scientists with pioneering research appro approaches. So this gives you a sense of how accomplished um, Dr. Feldman Barrett is. She's an elected fellow in numerous professional associations uh, and she's an, a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. This is the most prestigious fellowship for scholars in Canada. She's also the president-elect of the Association for Psychological Science, um, which demonstrates that she is about to take on a massive service assignment for the field overall. Her most recent book, um, you can see up here, is titled How Emotions Are Made, The Secret Life of the Brain. And it's been selected as one of the best nonfiction books of 2017. She has given a very popular TED Talk. Um, she's testified before Congress. She's been on several television shows, including the Today Show. If I were to go on and on about her accomplishments, it would take the full hour. So I'm going to stop there. Um, but it gives you a sense of how distinguished Dr. Feldman Barrett is and what a what an honor it is to have her. So today, um, Dr. Feldman Barrett's talk is entitled, Why Words Matter, Lessons from Neuroanatomy. Um, and please join me in welcoming Dr. Feldman Barrett to UVM. Thanks. So uh, thank you for the, is it on? Yeah. Um, so, first of all, Annie, thank you for that lovely introduction. And thanks all of you for being here today on such a gorgeous day. And I had to close the blinds so you could see the slides. So, hopefully uh, I will say something that is worthwhile or at least that will keep you awake. Actually, I'm sure I'll keep you awake for the next hour. Um, but let me just say, let me start actually with more thanks. Um, I, I would like to join Annie in thanking uh, the Burak Lecture Series for sponsoring um, this talk. Uh, Susan Davidson for uh, organizing the Department of Psychological Sciences, including Annie, um, for uh, hosting me today. I had a, a set of wonderful um, conversations, uh, including with someone who actually set me on the path, uh, you know, uh, Mark Bouton, who set me on the path actually to neuroscience, which he probably doesn't even know, but there he is. Um, and also uh, the UVM Center for Teaching and Learning. It's a real pleasure and honor for me to be able to be here and talk to you today. You know, normally I give talks to academic audiences um, and to public audiences about the nature of emotion. But when this invitation came in, um, I was asked to uh, talk about free speech. So here I am up here talking about free speech. That's, that's what I've been asked to do. And I should say, in this talk today, um, it, uh, you know, it's, uh, I'm going to show a little data to you, um, but I'm going to show it at a pretty high level, because really this is more meant to have a conversation about what the data mean for uh, uh, having um, important uh, discussions and making important decisions about who gets to speak at a university. 
and um, this is a topic that is currently, you know, um, the, I would say being debated, debate is kind of a kind word for, for what uh, is going on right now. Um, so I'll say that if you have any questions about the data specifically that I'm presenting, I can hold it to the end, I think that would be best, okay? So, um, so again, you know, I was invited here to talk about free speech. I should say I'm often invited to talk about free speech now, and I turn down almost every invitation um, uh, for reasons I think that will become clear. Uh, but I decided to do this one because of the way the Im invitation was issued. And I should say I've never actually given this talk before in public. So many times in front of the mirror, you know, or my husband, uh, my daughter, if she would listen to me. But uh, yeah, okay. So suppose, so I was invited to speak to you today. And suppose that the university had decided to invite somebody else to speak to you today instead of me. Would this be an example of me being censored, of me being, of my, uh, my uh, right to free speech being challenged? No, I don't think so. All it would mean is that you guys would have decided to invite somebody else. My free speech would not be violated because I could go to a public park and I could stand on a platform and I could s s talk very loudly about uh, my views. I could hop onto Twitter uh, for free at a public library and I could tweet away that would be assuming that I knew how to tweet really effectively. Um, I could publish, uh, self-publish a book on Amazon. I could even have a worldwide uh, audience on Facebook. And the same is true for every other person who was not invited to speak to you today. They are not having their free speech violated. At issue here, when we are making decisions about who to invite to speak to our students at a university, at issue here is not really freedom of speech, it's actually freedom of choice. People at a university, like yourselves, choose who is invited to speak. People who produce television shows choose who are invited to speak to their audience. Confusing freedom of choice and freedom of speech is where many arguments about free speech go horribly wrong, actually, right now in today's popular culture. And I'm going to use myself as the example rather than call anybody else out. About a year ago, I wrote an op-ed for the New York Times. Now I should tell you, I write, I on, on a, write several uh, op-eds a year for the New York Times, which usually garner a lot of email and uh, are you know, forwarded around. Uh, but this one uh, was, I think distinctive in its uh, impact. Basically, the, the op-ed said that uh, students need to grapple with ideas that they don't like and that even might offend them. That is a necessary component of a university education and something that all of us should be committed to as educators. At the same time, I presented evidence, some evidence, uh, biological evidence, that it matters how you exercise your freedom of choice in who you invite. It matters who you invite to speak um, to ensure that students will have this important educational experience. And so that is actually what I'm gonna to talk to you about today. Most of the research I'm gonna to present to you is not mine. It's research that I've read, authors some of whom I've talked to. Um, I will be showing you one or two pieces of my own research. But more generally, the point today is to show you a body of literature, just give you some examples, and then think about what the consequences are of this science, if any, for how we conduct ourselves around this issue of um, exposing students to uh, you know, challenging and sometimes uh, shocking and offensive ideas. And it begins with the, the, the insight that humans, all of us in this room, are social animals. We form long-term pair bonds. We care for our offspring over an extended period of time. We cooperate with each other and we reciprocate. And there is another important way in which we are social animals. And that is that we regulate each other's nervous systems. And we do it automatically and effortlessly without any awareness that we do it. And that has implications for how we interact with each other. Now, we are not unique as social animals on this planet. 
There are many, many social, there are many species of social animals. Insects, for example, some are social, and they regulate each other's nervous systems using chemicals, like this baby and the mama earwig. Look, she's cleaning her baby. Isn't it sweet? Seriously? No, seriously, it's, 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 I think it's adorable, actually. And I hate insects. Uh, mammals also use chemicals to regulate each other's nervous systems, so with uh, olfaction, as well as sound and touch. Primate mammals add vision. And human primate mammals, <laughs> like us, also use words and concepts. So here I'm showing you a, a photograph of my daughter Sophia when she was five and her dad. And they were going trick-or-treating as two superheroes that they invented, Brainia and Speed. Now, in our house, Brainia and Speed have starred in many movies, many uh, short movies, where they have solved mysteries and fought super uh, villains. And so when I say the word Brainia, in my house to these two, it has an immediate impact on their nervous systems. In fact, I can text, I love you, to my best friend who lives in the Netherlands, right? And without ever her hearing my voice or seeing my face, uh, I can change her heart rate, her breathing rate, uh, and her metabolism, uh, you know, in an instant. Similarly, I could uh, send a, a critical text uh, or an uncertain text to any of you, even if you don't know me. And I would bet that for many of you, that would have an instantaneous impact on your nervous system. It might not last very long, but uh, you know, research shows that we, we can uh, impact people's nervous systems really quickly in this way. So we regulate each other's nervous systems all the time without realizing it just by speaking words to each other. Most psychology experiments, or I should say many psychology experiments, actually depend on this uh, reality. So words are powerful. It may seem very far-fetched to you right now. It may seem uh, like almost unbelievable what I'm saying, but I'm hoping that by the end of this talk, uh, you know, it won't seem that unbelievable. You. We might then still disagree on what the consequence of this uh, truth is, but it is nonetheless a truth. So let me just give you one example from my own lab. What I'm going to show you here is uh, this it is an example of the power of words to influence the human brain. This is from a brain imaging study. Uh, and what you're looking at here are two images of the brain with blobs, color blobs on them, where the color blobs refer to um, changes in, uh, in brain activity while um, uh, people are, participants, test subjects, are listening to short narrative descriptions of situations in the scanner. So they're basically listening to words, and that's it. They're lying still, their eyes are closed, and what you're looking at here for those of you who are not familiar with brain images, this is a medial view of the brain. So you have two hemispheres, and if you crack the brain open like an egg, you would be looking at the inner surface of one of those hemispheres. This is the front, that's the back. This is a lateral view. So if you were to look at the side of a brain and then just go in a little bit, um, uh, this is what you would see. And the reason why we go in is that we want to be able to see this part of the brain here, which is called the insula, and it's usually hidden between the frontal and the temporal lobes. So we've just um, uh, chosen a, uh, an, a sort of a view that will let you see that. So despite the fact that subjects were lying still in the scanner with their eyes closed, we see uh, uh, well, let me just back up. We see activity in brain regions that are involved in movement, even though they're not moving, involved in touch, involved in vision, even though their eyes are closed, and in the regions of the brain that control your heart rate, your breathing, your metabolism, uh, basically your autonomic nervous system, your immune system, 
uh, and other systems of your body just by processing the meaning of words. Okay? So, here we see increased activity in motor cortex and in somatosensory cortex, in primary and secondary visual cortex. In primary and interoceptive cortex, that's for representing the sensory changes inside your body. And we also see increased activity in the thalamus, in the hypothalamus, and in a, a whole set of subcortical nuclei that regulate your autonomic nervous system, your immune system, and uh, your endocrine system, uh, your uh, metabolic systems, and so on. Now, here, what I want to show you is uh, what the language network looks like in the brain. Here again, we're looking at a lateral view of the brain, right? So the front of the brain is on the, there we go, front of the brain is on the left, back of the brain is on the right. And again, it's that lateral view with a depiction of the language system and its most important nodes, most important uh, parts the Broca's area and Wernicke's area. And so if you are understanding the words that I am speaking to you right now, this network is uh, getting a bit of a workout, okay? Now what I want to do is show you some real data, again from our lab, where what we did is we um, searched for all of the brain regions that are connected to Wernicke's area and Broca's area. So we can recover the brain's language network. And so what I'm going to show you first is, so that you understand what you're looking at, is a brain that we blew up so that you could see the folds of the cortex more easily. And then the blobs here indicate the regions of the brain that are connected to Broca's area and Wernicke's area. So this is the language network. This is in actual data uh, from uh, over 700 subjects. And again, you know, if you're understanding the words I'm speaking right now, then you have this network in your brain and it's working pretty well. Now here's the spatial overlap for the language network and the network that regulates those systems of your body, your autonomic nervous system, your immune system, your metabolism, and other systems. Basically, they overlap almost completely. So let me be really clear what this means. The same regions of the brain which help you process language control the systems of your body. They make your heart rate go up and down. They change the ease with which glucose gets into your blood. They change the um, extent to which chemicals are secreted so that you can uh, have an immune reaction. And in fact, in studies of non-human brains, like um, uh, birds, for example, we can show, in fact, data shows that the same neurons that control the body are also important for processing the sounds that animals use to communicate with each other, that is, their vocalizations. And these, uh, the neurons of these regions actually became the language network in humans. So this is not a... The fact that we have an overlap that, that is the very same network, the very same uh, regions that are working together so that you can understand language are also controlling your body is not an accident of like, uh, you know, the sort of spatial um, imprecision of brain imaging because uh, even when we look at individual neurons, we see something very similar. So the punchline so far to this is that words, you can think of words as tools for regulating the physiological systems of the body to meet the changing demands of the world around you. If you doubt this, think about the last time you gave comfort to someone who was in distress. You probably spoke words to them, in addition to doing other things, right? Maybe you pat them on the back, maybe you rub their arm, maybe you give them a hug, but words to also um, have an impact. And similarly, think about the last time someone spoke words to you and you uh, had a, a reaction that was unpleasant. 
I had, I just had one of those. I checked my email, which I should never do before I give a talk. And you know, there was uh, something from uh, my co-authors, you know, uh, of a manuscript uh, who were unhappy with uh, the review of a manuscript that. Uh, so I can tell you that my blood pressure felt like it changed in that moment, <laughs> not because of my co-authors who were fantastic, but. Um, Basically, the idea here is that words are an important way that we impact each other's nervous systems, right? The best thing for uh, a human is another, the best thing for your nervous system, for a human nervous system, is another human. And the worst thing for a human nervous system is another human. Because the words you speak have a direct effect on another person's physical state, and the words that they speak to you has an effect on yours. Whether you intend it, whether you mean it, whether you feel it, it's really not relevant. It's just really how we're wired. So when you encounter ideas that you may find insulting, your heart rate might change your blood pressure might rise. You probably won't feel your blood pressure rising, really. You probably won't really feel your heart rate changing. Most of the sensations um, from the body that, we, we, uh, that make it to the brain, we don't actually feel um, directly because we're not wired to do that. If you were wired to feel, you have an orchestra of movements going on in your body right now. And if you were wired to experience those directly, you would never pay attention to anything outside your own skin ever again. Anyone who's ever had a GI illness knows exactly what I am talking about. There were not enough laughs to that joke. It wasn't actually a joke, but OK. Right? So normally, we actually feel the sensations from our bodies as um, comfort or discomfort feeling pleasant or unpleasant, feeling distress or um, unpleasantness. And so if you were faced with someone saying something objectionable to you, you might have a moment of unpleasantness uh, that would go along with some physical change. So um, it might be unpleasant, but the question is, is it actually harmful? Can, it hurt, can words hurt you? You know, sticks and stones break your bones, but names can never hurt you. But can, is that true? Well, yeah, more or less it is, actually. I mean, all things being equal, um, you know, your brain actually benefits from periodic bouts of stress. And stress is uh, a moment, not a moment of subjective experience of distress, but a moment of stress, if we define it biologically, is where um, there's some kind of um, imbalance, you're, you know, your, your um, heart is racing unexpectedly, your brain is struggling to try to, uh, to, to prepare the body to act in a way to deal with uh, a particular important event. Um, so periodic bouts of stress, our nervous systems evolve so the periodic bouts of stress um, are necessary for keeping our nervous systems healthy. This is why it's important to exercise. You burden your body and then your body recovers and it's good for you. So on average, there is no harm to your brain or your body if you encounter a couple of instances where people talk about things that you don't like, maybe even insult you, um, uh, and maybe even say something about you directly or about a group that you belong to that makes you fear for your physical safety in a momentary way, right? Periodically, if this happens once in a while, you're gonna feel uncomfortable for a moment and then it will pass. But what if you are stressed over and over and over and over again? What if you are treading water in a simmering sea of stress where your nervous system is out of balance frequently and never given the opportunity to recover? Then any kind of stress, including words, uh, can slowly eat away at your brain and cause illness in your body. So if your nervous system is already encumbered, like, you know, from not sleeping enough, from not exercising enough, 
from not eating healthfully, from being socially evaluated in an ambiguous way, oh, this is out of order, <laughs> from financial hardship, um, from being uh, uh, ill, physically ill, or frankly, from just being an adolescent and having hormonal changes, or you know, being uh, menopausal and having hormonal changes, you guys are totally not laughing at any of my jokes. <laughs> this is like gonna be an impossible talk to get through for all of us if you are not gonna cooperate. Um, so, you know, these are the sorts of conditions that are pretty common in American life. Um, if you experience, if your nervous system is stressed by any of these things on a regular basis, then um, you're going to be more vulnerable to the biological effects of words that are not designed to offend you, but that are designed to threaten you or bully you or torment you. And frankly, it doesn't matter what your mindset is. It doesn't matter how positive you try to be. If you have biological signs of stress in your brain and in your body and you encounter someone who is threatening you, it will, you will have an effect. It will have an effect on you, not because you are a snowflake, but because you are a human. So let me give you just a taste of the literally hundreds of experiments that have been done to prove this point. So here's an example of data, of a study, where uh, the experimenters were looking at the effects of childhood maltreatment on ratings of anxiety, depression, and um, anger. This was uh, uh, 554 young adults aged 18 to 25. They were asked to rate their exposure to ongoing parental and peer verbal abuse when they were children, um, as well as physical abuse by someone, a member of their family, sexual abuse from someone outside their family. And, they, and uh, the experimenters looked for a relationship between uh, the uh, reports of um, abuse and maltreatment in childhood uh, and current concurrent uh, symptoms of, of mood disorders. So um, what I'm plotting here, so on the x-axis here, is just the effect size. And for those scientists in the room who care, this is a Cohen's D. So the bigger the numbers, the bigger the effect. And then on the y-axis are the types of maltreatment. And so here they are. And so what we can see from this study is that um, verbal abuse has an impact, sustained verbal abuse throughout childhood by parents and peers, or parents and or peers, um, uh, actually has an impact that is uh, on uh, mood disorder symptoms that is equivalent to sexual abuse by a family member um, outside of the, by, sorry, sexual abuse by someone outside the family. And uh, actually there's also a cumulative effect of this impact. Now what about something that's not self-report? So here's a study that measured the biological impact of growing up in a harsh uh, family environment that it contains lots of verbal criticism and conflict. So where your parents are basically criticizing you and each other frequently. This is 135 female adolescents who were measured on four occasions, as you can see across the x-axis, across 1.5 years. And on the y-axis, we are plotting two biological markers. Um, on the left, we're plotting IL-6, which is a measure of um, immune uh, dysfunction. The higher the number, the more the dysfunction. And on the right, we're plotting cortisol. Again, the higher the number, the more the dysfunction. So for girls who grew up, who are growing up in a, in a sort of a toxic family, verbally toxic family environment, there's no um, uh, physical abuse going on in these households. They show more immune dysfunction and more metabolic function, dysfunction as time goes on. And these are the girls, these are the, the adolescents who later in life, in middle age, um, we're, are, will be more likely to develop metabolic illness like diabetes and heart disease. They will be more likely to, and, uh, to develop um, uh, physical, mental illnesses as well. Uh, and on average, um, people who have any form of childhood adversity, um, are, uh, their mortality is actually decreased in adulthood. 
the amount that is decreased depends on how, what their exposure is. Girls who were at, you know, uh, the sort of the a had the average level of uh, experienced the average level of uh, a verbal uh, aggression from from parents and peers, which is the green line and the blue line. Um, basically showed no real change over time, and girls who were in a, uh, a family environment actually showed uh, with a less, significantly less uh, low levels of uh, verbal harshness actually um, showed uh, over time relative um, health. That's just one study. Actually, there are an increasing number of studies that consistently reveal a link between sustained social stress involving uh, verbal aggression, and an increase in the incidence of psychiatric and physical disease. So for example, there's evidence that verbal aggression can produce, alter sustained verbal aggression can produce alterations in immune response that's sufficient to reactivate a latent herpes virus. It will reduce the benefits from common vaccines, and it will slow the healings of wounds. And I should point out, these are not studies, this is just a handful of studies, right? They're, this is like a sample of studies I just pulled. These are not studies of vulnerable people. These are studies of average people across the political spectrum. And I should point out that findings like these hold whether or not test subjects say that they are experiencing distress. This is just exposure, repeated exposure to verbal aggression, whether people report feeling distressed or not. Here's a discovery that I'm going to show you that I find remarkable. Actually, as a scientist, I find it incredibly cool. As a person, I find it sort of horrifying. Um, unsaturated fats like fish oil and avocado and nuts are indeed healthy for your body unless you've been exposed to stress uh, during that day. If you've been exposed to stress during that day, your brain and body metabolize this healthy meal filled with healthy fats as if it were filled with unhealthy saturated fats. Now, when I first read this, I thought, okay, so is this like a license for me on a stressful day to eat French fries, which is what I really want to do when I'm stressed? It, I, I can't tell you what to do. You have to live with your own conscience there. I'm just saying, you know, if there's no difference, you might as well, you know. Or this, exposure to stress within two hours of a meal adds 104 calories. I know, right? <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I know. I honestly think I let out that kind of, when I heard a Janice Kiko Glazer present these data the first time, I, I, I made a noise like you, I was like, are you kidding me? So imagine that you are living the typical American life. You don't sleep enough, you don't exercise enough, you don't eat healthfully all the time. Um, you know, maybe you're dealing with some financial issues, Maybe you read the newspaper too much. <laughs> if you're me, you read the front page of the newspaper too much before breakfast. Um, if you're dealing with daily stress, uh, this adds 11 pounds a year to your weight. I, I'm going to mention the fact that we have an obesity crisis in this country, but so just before you're, you know, you know, you might want to dismiss this out of hand. I would just ask you to hold on with me for a couple of minutes because uh, maybe there's something to this. Okay, and then here's this. So there's a lot of data that I could show you, really beautiful data about brain atrophy in, in, uh, in response to stress. Um, but uh, in, in animals where really very specific, um, very detailed neural work has been done. But here we're talking about words, and words may not be relevant to a rat, so I'm gonna show you human data. Um, so here what I'm showing you is uh, part of the network in your brain that controls your body. And this looks a little different from the last one because it's a different sort of depiction. So again, it's a medial view of the brain. So if you crack the brain open and you look at one hemisphere, you're looking at the inner surface. And in this case, um, here is the front and here is the back. Oops, there is the back. And the blobs here are connectivity. Um, and here is uh, brain imaging research showing uh, where we see um, uh, uh, atrophy, um, brain atrophy due to prolonged and chronic stress. 
including social stress, which involves verbal aggression. So there is a decrease in cortical thickness, and there is a decrease um, in uh, connectivity um, in parts of the brain that are important for regulating your body when you are chronically stressed, which is the reason why, uh, one of the reasons why, not the only reason why it has an impact on uh, your physical health. But I should also point out that these parts of the brain in the yellow there are not specific to regulating your body and to processing language and to, uh, uh, you know, so on. They're also important for learning and cognitive flexibility. In fact, they're important, if this were a different talk I could show you, they're important to almost every, in, they're, they sh these brain regions show an increase in activity in almost every psychological domain that we've ever studied, frankly. Um, but specifically for learning and cognitive flexibility and planning for the future, um, uh, they're important. So other people's words don't only affect your health, they also affect your ability to learn. And if you think that that is an example of me being uh, a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit of hyperbole, you will see in a minute that I am not, actually. That is a direct quote. Um, so here's an example. There was a study where 20 healthy adults, and these were, um, I have to tell you, not to scare you, but in this particular study, it was uh, medical interns and residents. I know, right? Wait. Um, one, they experienced one month of social stress, so conflict, you know, involving uh, verbal uh, aggression and conflict. They showed at the end of this one month, reduced connectivity in a variety of brain networks, including the networks I showed you, and they showed reduced, the reduced ability uh, to perform cognitive control tasks, which means they were less able to pay attention to, to important information, they were less able to shift their attention, and they were less able to learn new information. So think about that the next time you're in an emergency room. The good news is that, actually, after one month, uh, of, uh, of, um, where, uh, of a period of reduced stress, uh, this returned to normal. They're actually, their brains returned to normal. So what we're talking about here is the, you know, a single bout of even really horrible, um, something that's really horrible and stressful from someone that you, from another human basically, um, will, won't necessarily, or just a couple of instances, are not going to have a, a lasting effect on your nervous system. But prolonged stress will. And um, even if the prolonged stress isn't verbal, if you are already vulnerable because you are living in a, if you are living in American culture, then the likelihood that any of those, um, you know, uh, stressors uh, might affect you is, is higher, and that actually makes you vulnerable to um, actually having a, a, an effect, a, a larger effect to sustain verbal, um, verbal aggression. So I want you to consider what these biological findings mean for those of us living at this particular moment in time in our culture. You know, right now, we live in a culture of casual brutality, where people regularly say horrible things to each other in newspapers, on television, on the radio, in emails, on Facebook, on tw you know, Twitter, and so on and so forth. Each instance on its own may not have a lasting effect on your health, but when they are strung together over time, particularly when other stressors are present, they can have a slow cumulative effect that can persist. And if you are an adolescent or a young adult, this effect can persist into middle age and make you more vulnerable to the diseases of aging. So does mindset matter here? Well, of course, you know, of course it's better to turn a potential stressor into something humorous by reframing it, or I would say recategorizing it to get some distance from it. So here is a, a clip that I pulled um, from uh, Jimmy Kimmel, uh, where Barack, President Barack Obama is, uh, 
you know, actually, this is a longer clip, and my husband said, you can't show them the whole clip. It's going to really bore them. But I, I love this clip because I think it's really... It's a good Is there any way we could fly Obama to some golf course halfway around the world and just leave him there? <laughs> well, RW is surfer girl. I think that's a great idea. And so he basically just reads all these, you know, nasty tweets, and then he makes clever, you know, comments, and it's really funny. And uh, so, you know, of course, that's a great example of uh, having a positive mindset and, uh, you know, that it can, it can buffer you a little bit, right? But mindset matters less when someone is verbally aggressive to you directly, to your family, to a social group of which you are a member in a way that directly threatens you. Now, I'm going to show you a series of emails and text messages and tweets and so on from uh, my own personal experience, I'm not going to expose anybody else to this, that uh, were published after my op-ed. These uh, came to me after my um, op-ed was published and, that a, uh, and after a, an appearance that I made on the Tucker Carlson show on Fox. And I'm going to read them to you out loud because I want you to see what it feels like to have words spoken to you like this. Hey, liberal scumbag. And I'm not going to do it with like, you know, I'm not going to read it like, hey, liberal scumbag. I'm just going to leave the prosody off just so that you can get the words, right? Hey, liberal scumbag, you're going to pay, we're going to pay a visit at your home. I hope, you're using, I hope my use of free speech offends you. You're a fucking leftist cunt. Jewish entry into prestigious fields must be restricted. In the latest example, the neuroscientist Lisa Feldman Barrett, with my name in parens. Does anyone know what that name in parens means? Anyone? It's a code. It marks you as Jewish on, you are in the bullseye. So I, when I, the first time I got one of these, I was like, what the hell is this? It, this means you're a Jew and you're marked. I didn't even know this existed, frankly. Um, and I should point out to you, these are not, this is not like, I'm not picking the couple of worst examples of the, uh, of, you know, the, the messages that were sent to me. I'm picking, randomly I picked out of thousands of them. Um, the person who helped make this slide, these slides for me, um, you know, was <laughs> really upset by them because he hadn't ever seen anything like this before. Hey, Lisa, you're ugly, stupid, inane, probably a carpet-munching dyke. Your clothes look like they came from goodwill. That one really hurt. Your, <laughs> your specialty is a bunch of leftist bullshit. If you were near me, I'd spit in your eye. You can't speak extra... <laughs> I've tried this word so many times. Extemporaneously for shit. You're un-American, and your agenda is never going to be never going, is your agenda is never going to come to be over our dead fucking bodies, bitch. And then so on and so forth. Please kill yourself. Your life is not worth living. Fuck off, cunt, and murder yourself. You're nothing more than an ignorant cunt that needs to be put down like a fucking dog. Socialist garbage such as yourself will be killed off. Go ahead, smirk. A thousand meters and a clear line of sight. So over the course of, I'm still receiving um, emails uh, like this, actually, and sometimes tweets. Uh, and I turn my Facebook, uh, I, turn, I made my Facebook private so people can't uh, comment on it. Um, so over the course of a number of uh, weeks, I received thousands of these because I wrote an op-ed that people actually misunderstood. But that's sort of beside the point. They, they, you know, it wasn't an op-ed about free speech. It was an op-ed about freedom of choice. Um, but still, they disagreed, and that's what I got. Not, um, you know, you're, I disagree with you, and, and here's why. Not um, even, like, your ideas are stupid. No, I, I guess uh, what I want to kind of point out is that I should point out that this is pretty typical stuff for anybody who is in um, the public eye these days. Um, so it turns out, as this was happening to me, Pen America, the literary um, guild in the United States, came to me because uh, they, they had, I, I was, some people had read my book, 
because um, it was nominated for an award. And, um, and uh, there's a part in the book where I talk about stress. And it turns out that many journalists uh, and uh, people in the media and academics are actually receiving uh, messages like this on a pretty regular basis. And they wanted me to help them design um, a, a survey to help figure out how many people are suffering and, does, and if anybody needs actually to talk to a therapist or, or see a physician. Um, and so now we're actually doing research um, on, uh, to try to you know, look at the linguistic structure of these um, emails for, for a bunch of reasons. Uh, and I did help them uh, you know, put this together, this survey. But the thing I, I want to say is, I don't, I, when did it become okay to talk to people like this? Like, when did it become okay that we talk to each other like this it, to debate? Right? Casual brutality has become the norm. Open your newspaper, listen to the radio. It's routinely, and it's routinely fed to us on, on, as entertainment on television. Um, so, in, in movies, so for example, here's a clip. This is gonna take about a minute and a half, but I want you to watch it um, through. This is a clip from a popular sitcom that adolescents watch, or used to watch, anyways. <sighs> Cats. Eli, Beck, and Tori. Okay, let's give them a place. Home. Home! Ooh, real creative. You be quiet. Ow! And now we need a situation. Big news. Andre, nobody wants to see big nudes. <laughs> news? Ah, oh, well, that's different. Big news! Uh, why don't you go wait in the hall? Uh, okay. Okay, at home, big news and action. Hey, babe, how was work today? Uh, I got fired. Oh, again? It's okay. I have great news that'll cheer up this whole family. What you is know? it? Tell us. I went to the animal shelter and got us... A dog! Uh, yep. I'm the new family dog. Woof. Psychowitz, will you please tell this amateur that dogs can't talk and that they don't walk on two legs? Psychowitz! Oh, I'm sorry, I was sucking the milk out of this coconut. <laughs> but it's true, Tori, if you're gonna play a dog, be a dog. Whoops. And action! Uh, I went to the animal shelter and got us a dog. Wow! Oh. Uh-oh. Looks like this dog has bugs in her fur. Uh, wolf. Yeah. Oh. Okay, so it goes on and on from there and it just gets worse. Um, this is just one example. Uh, of what happens in situation comedies, both those designed for children and for general audiences. Um, analyses have been done uh, by the papers I reference uh, here, which shows that some uh, episode of verbal or relational aggression occurs in over 90% of the programs that were sampled from mainstream television. Um, uh, sitcoms, actually, that's actually more than uh, reality TV shows, which uh, come in at about 71%. And in 50 TV shows that were the most popular with uh, children and adolescents, uh, four, there were on average 14 different incidents of uh, verbal uh, aggression per hour or one every four to five minutes. To a laugh track where the victim is basically not showing her distress or his distress. And the adults either are, don't notice, they're basically you know, depicted as idiots who don't notice or actually inadvertently play along. Why does this matter? Because evolutionary biologists and anthropologists for a number of years have been studying uh, the fact that um, humans you know, are successful as a species uh, because we model each other's behavior. This is called selective cultural learning. And we particularly are inclined to copy other people who are successful, 
who are higher in prestige, who are high in social status, like movie stars on television and or on, in movies, or, you know, I don't know, the President of the United States. And indeed, evidence shows that uh, teens actually report that they are more likely to imitate uh, this aggression themselves after they view it on television, and actually children who were observed uh, uh, were actually um, were more likely to model this relational aggression at school. Now, there's a positive side to this too, right? It's also the case, um, uh, there's a wonderful research um, to show um, that uh, by Betsy Palak that if you um, go into a school and you find the highest status kids in that school and you do bully uh, training, uh, you know, anti-bully training on them, it actually eventually changes the whole tenor of the school, right? The point is that we observe each other, we model each other. Um, this is actually part of how we coordinate with each other. Um, and, uh, and so if we are speaking horribly to each other uh, and our kids are watching it, then they're gonna do that too and suffer the consequences, frankly, the biological consequences. So all of this together creates a, a, a culture of, uh, of uh, casual brutality and, you know, what are the consequences? Well, we can speculate. We can just do, you know, we don't know anything causal, but we can look correlationally. Um, we have an opioid crisis in this country. People are self-medicating uh, their distress with opioids. They might start to take opioids to deal with the pain that comes, the, you know, what we would, we would call it nociceptive pain that comes from uh, tissue damage or injury um, but they often continue to take, there are biological reasons that they continue to take opioids, which are highly addictive, um, but it does actually medicate, it does actually reduce uh, distress, feelings of distress. We have record high levels of obesity and metabolic illness in this country, and we also have a high level, record high levels of depression and suicide, particularly in adolescents and young adults. And according to the World Health Organization, depression is on track to become the leading killer worldwide um, in another decade or so, and will outstrip um, heart disease. Depression is also a metabolic illness. So, the, why are people suffering in this way? You know, and what does this, this sort of culture of brutality have to do with it? Well, we can't say for sure, like I said. It, this is just correlational, and uh, it may have no impact at all. But actually, if you look at the data, and you understand the biological impacts on um, uh, biological embedding, as it's called, of stress, um, then uh, it's suggestive. Not because the people who are suffering from these illnesses and discomfort, distress, are snowflakes. Not because they're socialists or communists. Not because they have certain political beliefs. Not because they believe in political correctness. But because they are human. They are human and they have human nervous systems. And humans are social animals who, when we speak words to each other, have an impact on each other's brains and bodies. Human nervous systems are wired this way. We, wouldn't, we couldn't live if, it wasn't, if that wasn't the case, right? The people around you, the, you're close, the people who are close to you, um, the people who you love and who love you, help to bear the burden of your, the metabolic burden of your nervous system, and you help to bear theirs. And in fact, if, when you lose someone who passes away because, you know, uh, who, who, uh, feel, who was very close to you, and you feel as if you've lost a part of yourself, it's because you actually have. You've lost someone who helped to keep your nervous system regulated. And you feel the effects of that for some period of time. So no matter who you are, no matter how tough you are, no matter what you believe, this scientific evidence can apply to you, and it can apply to your students. And so if you have a brain, then that brain can be harmed by prolonged exposure to verbal aggression, including, but not limited to, the casual brutality of everyday life. So what does this mean about um, you know, choosing speakers at a university, which is actually what my original uh, op-ed was about. Well, let's suppose that, it shouldn't be hard for you, that you actually work at a university. <laughs> we all, most of us do, who are here. 
And the part of your mission is to expose students to ideas that they disagree with or that they even find offensive and maybe even shocking. And let's say you have the choice between choosing between two speakers. One speaker presents arguments that students find offensive, which prompts them to engage in vigorous debate, to come up with uh, arguments maybe against uh, the, what the speaker is saying, and in the process become critical thinkers. That would be a successful educational outcome. Successful educational outcomes don't, aren't indexed by people feeling good all the time. Sometimes feeling bad is okay. Sometimes feeling bad is an indication that you're doing something important. I always tell my graduate students that. It's a way of inoculating them. I always say, if at some point in your educational career you aren't completely miserable and in tears and just feeling like you need to, you just don't know what you're doing here, you're not doing it right. Because a PhD is, should help you challenge your deeply, your deepest held beliefs should be challenged. And that is a profoundly unpleasant process. However, you have another choice. Maybe it's another speaker. And this speaker hurls insults and marginalizes groups of people and overtly threatens the safety of someone, maybe, or is deliberately incendiary. In our culture of brutality, where nervous systems of so many people are even a little bit under load, the second type of speaker merely adds to the burden without any educational benefit at all. So the message of this talk and the message of that op-ed was to exercise your freedom of choice and invite the first speaker. You are not violating the First Amendment rights of the second speaker when you do this. I thought this was a pretty straightforward argument, frankly. Granted, you know, I only had 800 words. I didn't have a whole hour to talk about it. Um, that was the message, but that's not the message that people read. And in fact, I was invited on uh, to appear on the Tucker Carlson show last year to talk about this op-ed. Um, this show is helped to engender all of those lovely comments that you saw earlier. Um, Mr. Carlson framed my op-ed as if it was about anti-free speech, while um, in fact it was not about free speech at all, it was about freedom of choice. Now, I made a, a number of mistakes appearing on this show, but the biggest one was my confidence that I could persuade this guy to have a spirited debate with me. Um, and right out of the gate, he began asking leading questions and putting words in my mouth, uh, which I refuse to answer questions when people do that. I just won't. You know, it's like, um, you know, it's like that old, um, you know, uh, example from a courtroom drama, you know, when, when did you kill your wife? Like, well, you know, the, answering the question affirms the assumption. I'm just not going to do that. So we never actually had a conversation. And this was a missed opportunity to debate the idea that science can offer some suggestions for how to exercise freedom of choice in deciding who to invite and who not to invite to speak at a university or any public forum. Um, this show is a perfect example of what happens when the media serves up entertainment as if it were actually information. So here is the argument really briefly, and then I'll be pretty much done. U.S. tort and criminal law invokes the concept of the reasonable person to denote a hypothetical person in society who has average reactions to things and who exercises the average amount of control in situations and therefore serves for a standard for behavior. So we can apply the reasonable standard, the reasonable person standard to guide our freedom of choice of who to invite to speak uh, in a public forum like a university. So consider inviting a speaker who will expose students to ideas, even offensive ideas, that will prompt a debate. I chose this example because I'm Jewish. I might as well pick on myself. People do say this. So have a debate about it. Consider not inviting a speaker whose statements are sufficiently verbally aggressive that the reasonable person will find them threatening. This comment fuck off, you Jewish cunt, I'm coming to your house to shoot you, um, is uh, an example of what, over time, in sufficient quantities, will hurt your brain and your body. It also happens to be against the law. This is an example of assault, the intent to harm, specific intent to harm. But what about a statement like this? 
This is in the middle somewhere. It's actually not assault. It comes close, but it's actually legal to say this to someone. And so um, this is where the concept of the reasonable person could come in, except the reasonable person is a fiction. There, you know, there are no hypothetical people. There are real people, right? And so this is where science can be helpful, because in science, we define the hypothetical average person in actually concrete statistical terms. If you've sampled well, then the average of your sample is a statistical instantiation of the hypothetical, you know, uh, reasonable person. Except it's not hypothetical, we've estimated it. So in the studies that I showed you earlier, if you can measure a group of test subjects who are systematically exposed to verbal aggression, like the middle quote, and they show biological markers of illness and even some brain changes, then, and those studies replicate, then you have a really good example of science acting like a guideline for who to invite and who not to invite. And I should point out to you that the studies that I showed you where we see uh, a relationship, for example, between verbal harshness and um, you know, uh, cortisol and inflammatory uh, uh, dysregulation were not as harsh as that statement. So to me, it just seems really clear that we should consider the fact, or at least debate the fact, or debate the, the suggestion that research, uh, the research that we discussed earlier, can, be, can offer some guidance in choosing who to invite, namely people who do discuss controversial topics that are important for teaching students how to uh, learn how constructive um, ways of critical debate and critical thinking, even if it's around topics that they don't like, and it's not necessary to use overt verbal aggression to do it. And in fact, they'll probably think better if you don't. So this talk was, I'm wrapping up now, and I, I just want to make a couple of more very brief comments. One is that this talk was not about free speech, but since people keep inviting me to talk about free speech and uh, keep putting words in my mouth about free speech that I don't believe, I might as well tell you exactly what I do believe, which is that in our culture we face a fundamental dilemma. We have strongly individualistic values, um, but we are wired as social animals. Free speech is important. It's necessary to a democracy, but we are we are also wired to be social animals who impact each other. That's one of our evolutionary adaptations as a species. Um, and some biologists and anthropologists think that's why we dominate the Earth, unless we compare ourselves to bacteria, but you know. So how do we cultivate personal uh, freedoms when we are physiologically dependent on each other? This dilemma is the source of virtually every problem that we have in this country right now. And it's not a partisan issue, it cuts both ways. Consider gun ownership. Conservatives want personal freedom and liberals want control. Consider abortion. Liberals want personal freedom and conservatives want control. Nobody owns this debate, right? It just is persistent. Like it or not, we impact the brains and the bodies of those around us with the words that we speak, and they return the favor for us. So how do we deal with this fact? Well, this is what I think. When it comes to any kind of freedom, we don't need, you know, if we want to preserve freedom, we don't need more laws. We do not need to restrict personal freedoms. We should protect free speech. We take individual freedoms in this country very seriously, and we absolutely should. I think the way to deal with this fundamental dilemma is by realizing that freedom always comes with responsibility. You are free to act and speak, but you are not free from the consequences of what you say and do. You might not care, you might not agree, but it actually doesn't matter because one way or another, if you contribute to this culture of casual brutality, you will pay. One way or another, you will pay if other people are harmed by your words. How will you pay? You will pay with increased health care costs due to increases in metabolic illnesses like diabetes and depression and heart disease. 
you will pay because of ineffective government, because people have lost the ability to compromise by spewing crap at each other instead of having reasoned debate and finding compromise, which is what I understand the Founding Fathers actually uh, intended when they wrote the Constitution. You will pay with reduced innovation in a global economy because when students are stressed, they don't learn as well and they don't have the resources to be creative, which often involves failing and picking yourself up and trying again. Failing fast and frequently is part of innovation. No one has the resources to do that if they are already encumbered. And as we discussed today, you will pay by creating a citizenry that can't effectively discuss or debate difficult topics, which puts our um, democracy at risk. So the bottom line is we're educators. It's crucial that we create a context for students to engage with all sorts of ideas, even those that they find challenging and offensive. We don't want to coddle students. It doesn't serve their education or our democracy. But when choosing speakers to invite to a campus or in any public forum, choose wisely. Choose debate. Don't choose hate. Periodic bouts of conflict when handled responsibly are an opportunity to listen and learn, which science shows you can't do when your nervous system is already encumbered. And this is only one example of the many things that maybe we want to think about doing to vanquish this uh, uh, casual brutality that currently plagues our culture. Freedom of choice in who we invite to speak at a university is just a small piece of that puzzle to protect our democracy and to avoid the mistakes of the past. I think this is a place where science actually has a role in public discourse. You might disagree with me, um, and that's okay, we can debate that. Um, but uh, that's my, my position, that uh, you know, we're always being told as scientists that we have to make our science useful to the public. This is a place where I think our science is really useful to the public. Um, your choices, your freedom, your uh, words ha have a consequence, and they have a price, and that price is a basic responsibility for your impact on other people. Your, the wiring of your uh, brain and, and everyone else's you know, guarantees that this is true. And uh, with that, I, I want to thank my lab, uh, who uh, has you know, weathered many storms with me as I have uh, ventured out into the public. Uh, to um, share science, and also who helped to conduct the studies that, uh, the, that were from my lab, uh, that I, from our lab that I showed you today. Um, and uh, some of these ideas, particularly about the role of, uh, that we have as social animals, uh, you can find in this book. I also have, um, as Annie mentioned, there are a number of talks and podcasts and things where I've discussed this online, on, on my website. Um, Free speech and freedom of choice is not discussed in this book, and it is not, there aren't, isn't too much on the website uh, necessarily about that. So I'll thank you for your patience, and I'll take questions. Okay, um, so I did want to let people know after we'll do a couple of questions, we can also then move out. There's a reception um, out in the fireplace lounge. Um, but I thought we could do a question or two while we're in here. So please raise your hand. I will bring the mic over to you. Thanks for your talk. Uh, your take on uh, race and ethnic relations where there can often be a situation where because of sort of privilege and obliviousness, a statement without any intent to be aggressive comes across that way and may, as far as I know, register on some of the physiological tests that you have devised. Sure. So, um, I, yeah, I didn't devise them. I, I wish I had, but I'm not that clever. So, um, so yeah. So here's what I would say. Um, so, um, sure, we all say things at times 
um, that have an unintended effect on other people. Um, but I don't think that's what we're talking about here. You know, I'm not talking about, um, I'm not talking about the, I guess, let me just say two things. One is that when I'm thinking about it, inviting speakers, I'm not talking about people who, um, I think people should talk about race, and I think people should talk about what, 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 people, what could be potentially stressful uh, to, to members of minority groups. And that's not just true for race, it's true for many forms of ethnicity and even gender. Uh, that being said, I think if you're lecturing in a class, for example, um, or you have a student who says something in a class and says something that um, another person finds stressful, and it's a single event, First of all, the, there's not going to be any harm to the person might experience a, a momentary uh, change in, in their nervous system, but it's not, not gonna, there's not going to be any lasting harm. Um, but, you know, uh, hopefully somebody else will point that out to you, or you can take the other student aside, um, the student who said something that was inadvertently um, uh, insulting, or that another student found insulting, and you can use it as an educational experience. I've actually, not right then, you have to ask the student's permission to do it, but invite them to do it in class. We've done, I've done this, I actually talked about this in my op-ed. When I came to the United States, I'm from Canada, which makes me a socialist right off the bat, apparently. Um, but, um, uh, you know, I was sort of um, flummoxed by r race relations here. I mean. You know, we have our own issues in Canada. Um, and we talked about this last night at dinner. We have our own issues in Canada, but they, and actually I can't speak about Canada currently because I haven't lived there for more than 25 years, so I have no idea. But when I was living there, and I, I should say, I've worked on uh, indigenous uh, reservations, you know, in January, north of Winnipeg. I mean, I've lived in harsh conditions. <laughs> with indigenous people, and uh, not, I don't live there all the time, obviously, but I've seen what they have to contend with. So in our, in Canada, it's things about language and things about, you know, whether you're indigenous or whether you are uh, European, of European descent. But so when I came to the United States, I sort of tripped into, uh, I'm just used to treating everyone by the same set of standards, but the university where I went to work had an African-American training program, training program for African-Americans in, uh, in graduate school. And the students had concerns about the fact that I was ex holding them to a standard that they felt was unfair because they didn't have access to the preparation uh, before they uh, arrived. And so instead of berating them I, uh, or saying anything about it, I went and did the only thing that I knew would, that I thought would be useful, which is I found the only, we only had one African-American faculty member, and I was an assistant professor, and I was new, so I went to him and I said, can you please explain to me what's going on? Like, I completely don't understand what's happening. And he did explain it to me, and um, we did actually talk about this in class, and we actually engaged in debate in class around issues related to race, because it was relevant to the class. And I invited my now new friend um, into the class, and this was a class where we were teaching something about intelligence testing, which has a quite nefarious history uh, uh, related to eugenics, um, particularly for African Americans. And so we debated. We debated the use. We debated eugenics in the classroom. Um, you know, he took the he he my, this my newfound friend uh, who was African American took the pro position. I took the con position, and then halfway through we switched. Now, was that stressful to people? I'm sure it was. Did they dislike it? Yeah, absolutely. I disliked it too. <laughs> but it was necessary. So I think if you say something that's inadvertently um, uh, harmful, it ends up being inadvertently harmful, invite your students to talk about that with you and own it and discuss it and explain why it's important you know, that, you, uh, that you do such things. That may sound like a trivial, nice guy kind of thing to do, but I think that is the only way uh, that we can handle such situations. Okay, let's do one more question, then we will move ourselves out. Hi, so I came in a little late, so I'm sorry if you touched on this before. Um, 
But I was wondering, in terms of conversations, there's obviously a difference between interactions that you're having in person versus online because there's uh, differences in tone and facial expressions and kind of a different interpersonal context. And I'm wondering if you could address, uh, I guess, the potency of the effects you see as they differ according to online versus in-person interactions. And maybe if there are other contexts online that kind of iterate those facets that we see in person. Yeah. So here's the, this is a, I'll make, I'll try to make this short. I think when someone sends you an email that says, I hope you fucking die, it doesn't really matter whether they say it uh, over email or, uh, it doesn't matter whether it's said over social media. I'm going to come to your house and I'm going to hunt you down, which is actually, you know, we had to get two police uh, forces involved because, you know, we had things like that. So I don't think that matters very much. I think what matters, where it matters is that, uh, Anything which is a social communication which is ambiguous is hard. Ambiguity is expensive for a human nervous system. Uncertainty is just expensive for any nervous system because you don't, your, your brain's having to, you know, try to figure out how to prepare to act and also what it means. It's just metabolically expensive and it's very stressful for humans in particular. Social evaluation, especially if it's ambiguous or unclear or uncertain is like the worst. It's actually even worse than having someone tell you that they don't like you. And so from that perspective, here's, the, here, here's what I'd say. In-person conflict is actually the easiest to deal with from a nervous system standpoint because all the context is there. Um, so if I say, if, you know, if I'm in high school and I say, hey, bitch, you're looking fucking ugly today, which actually kids do say, um, if we're face to face and I say it like that, maybe, maybe you kind of know I don't, I'm actually greeting you in a, in a nice way. Maybe you don't. But, you know, but what if it's said over the phone where there's less context, right? Or, or even, you know, even um, video, there's not complete context there. Or the phone or Facebook, or YouTube, or not YouTube, like YouTube comments, or, or um, Twitter. I mean, Twitter, uh, or even um, like texting. Texting is almost to some extent the worst because you can see when the other person has read your message, and then when they don't answer back, you don't know why, right? So it's filled with tremendous ambiguity. What does a human brain do when there's, it's filled with all that ambiguity? And there is no tone to any text message or email. It fills in. It uses past experience to fill in and simulate that missing information, which is why we have emojis, right, partially. Um, it's extremely stressful, actually. So one of the reasons why social media is very stressful for, for everybody, if they stay on it too long, is because it, it heightens the uncertainty and ambiguity in social interactions.